Hey everybody, welcome to another U.S. History screencast. Uh, today we are going to be talking about summarizers. So um, I don't know about y'all, but this is one of those things that I add to the end of the year list where I'm like, all right, what can I do better next year? And I think we all sort of fall victim to at the end of the class, you're working on a project or you're just like, I just need to talk about one more thing. Um, and I'm going to skip my summarizer. And I think that's just a a huge disservice to our students because you know there's tons of research out there and um, really just if you think about how our own brains work uh, it really really helps to sort of organize our thoughts and see all right what do we know what do we not know what do we need to spend more time on um, so that that's self-assessment and then you know as a teacher the the actual assessment of our students please 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 as much as you can try and you know stop your lesson even if it feels a little weird and really give your students a, a second to reflect on what y'all learned that day. All right, let's jump right into it. So just like we said, um, just to kind of summarize my opening monologue there, um, it really does help your students reflect on what they need to spend more time on. And, you know, uh, as a teacher, we need to have some sort of assessment, whether it's formal, informal, whatever, you know, did they actually absorb anything? And if they did, where might you need to spend um, you know, more time on the opener the next day. So they play a vital role in sort of figuring out what's going on with your students and where you need to spend more time. So here we go. Um, I like to give you all actual physical things that you can use, you know, the day after you watch this, where, uh, you know, whenever you watch this. Um, so this is called one word summary, and you may have done this before, but if not, this is how it works. Very simple. Have students summarize the entire day's lesson in only one word. And it actually sounds like, oh, that's not, you know, that difficult. Um, but if you've ever done this before, it's actually a lot more difficult than you would think. Equally as important as the word is the explanation that comes after. So don't allow them to just get away with saying one word and not explaining. Um, and hopefully you do that in your class anyways. That's just kind of a good practice to not let students just throw out blind uh, assertions and make them actually back up what they're saying. So let's, uh, let's use an example here. Let's imagine that, uh, you know, you can't teach the 1960s in a day, or hopefully you, you didn't do that. Uh, but let's just say you're, you're at the end of your 1960s unit or, um, you know, the past week you've been talking about the 60s and at the, on Friday, you want them to sort of summarize it. So, um, you know, the goal obviously is one word, remind them what one word is because um, you'll have them uh, do anything from saying a whole sentence to a couple of different words, and um, that's the hard part, do it in one word. So, for example, one that pops into my head um, is turmoil, right? So the 60s, you got a lot of stuff going on, as you can see in some of the pictures that I decided to throw in here. Um, you've got a lot of different things with uh, social movements, whether it be civil rights, women's rights. Um, you've got the anti-war protests, um, you've got music, uh, you have the Cold War in full effect, you have the assassination of a president, um, you know, I've left some stuff out, but um, a lot, a lot of craziness going on, um, and very tumultuous times, um, so that idea of turmoil um, really sort of encapsulates some of the main ideas, um, so one of the goals to get your students to do is have one that is sort of all encompassing. So for example, something similar to turmoil, you could say crazy. And with the explanation, the student can get away with it. Uh, but you want them to try and go a little bit deeper than just, you know, say, man, the 60s were crazy, you know. Um, so uh, what's another one we could use, uh, you could say something like revolutionary, right. So um, sort of like, you know, the 1920s or the roaring 20s, you know, you could synthesize real quick and just say that, you know, this is a time period where things are changing rapidly. Um, and you sort of have a lot of people that don't like that. So, you know, that's where sort of the modern day conservative movement comes in to sort of rebound um, with all of the change going on in the 60s. Uh, many Americans are like, whoa, this is too fast. This is too fast. So by saying, you know, instead of saying, like we said earlier, crazy, you could say revolutionary. Um, and that idea of change, um, not only, um, you know, physical movement of people, but also ideas as well. So 
that's um that's something you can do so just make sure the students don't just say something very simple and give you a you know one sentence explanation really get them to dig deep and you know hopefully you're doing that in your class um, at all times something else you can do um, this is a simile like you've all heard in a bunch of English classes or whatever uh, but basically this is a way to sort of make them sort of think a lot deeper than you would actually um, maybe just then rote memorization. So with the simile, you get something that's seemingly disconnected from the material that you're talking about. An example, how is the Great Depression like a house? When the students hear this for the first time, they're like, it's not like a house at all. Um, but once they start thinking about, okay, what makes a house what it is? You know, it's built. Um, what happens when there's shoddy work done? Um, you know, a variety of different things that you could go into. You can go to the individual pieces of the house. So this is quite difficult at first for students, but sometimes when they hear a couple, they're like, oh, okay, that's not as crazy as I thought it was. So one thing that they could potentially say, um, and I actually do this particular one in my class, um, a lot of times students go into the idea of the stock market building the foundation of, you know, the boom of the 20s, um, which, you know, is very similar to a house. So if you have a uh, you know, loose foundation or, um, you know, the structure that you're building on top, if it's made out of, you know, really bad material or a bunch of fake stuff, basically, um, it's going to tumble. Um, and it's going to tumble and really hurt some people. So it's, um, you know, it's this example where you're basically showing that the stock market essentially is the foundation of a house or the foundation of the economy. Um, and then if it's, you know, built off of uh, something that's not real, so all these people borrowing on credit, if it's not real, and then eventually the bubble bursts, and it leads to the Great Depression, that's exactly like the house tumbling to the ground. And you can use this for whatever, you know, um, use any object and get them to sort of compare it to uh, something that you're talking about. So this is a great, real easy one. Um, that you can put into really any context uh, or any material. Another one that I do, and this is what I do actually, if, you know, sometimes we have five minutes at the end of class, um, you know, depending on how you're feeling that day, I'm usually the type of person that doesn't want them to just sit there because usually they start flocking towards the door. And I don't know why, but that's one of my big pet peeves. But basically this actually gets them going a little bit. And like always, you can use a non US history related one at first. Um, at some point, somebody added a question. My kids are always like, it's 21 questions. Nah, uh, 20 questions. That's, that's what, I've all, what I've always played. So, um, you know, subtract one. Um, but if you've never played before, you have an idea in your head, or you can even get a student to do it. And uh, the students ask yes or no questions. So it's got to be in yes or no format. And they try and get to that main idea that you're thinking about. One example that I use is... Um, you know, my students in, with the old standards couldn't remember what the halfway covenant was. So I would do that one because, you know, on the unit one test or whatever, that I realized that they didn't remember that. So when we went over religion later on, I could sort of bring that back up. Um, so that's something that you could do, or you could just have one idea, or you could have a person or whatever. Um, but the key is, is there's really sort of... Um, an underlying thing that you're getting them to understand and uh, help them think about their thinking or what we call metacognition is, you know, if you're playing this game uh, and you may want to just let them do poorly first, or maybe they just will be great at it. Um, you want them to eventually understand that, Hey, like I need to start with a broad idea first and then slowly narrow it down. So um, for example, if, uh, the student thinks it's George Washington. They don't want to say George Washington right off the bat. You know, is it George Washington? And if it's no, then you really haven't helped with the rest of the game. So you would want to say, is it a person first? Because that's you know a broader category that will um, help you further on in the game. So you want them to start thinking about their thinking and getting them to say, all right, if I go way too focused first, we're going to lose this game miserably. And, you know, obviously they don't want me to win. So um, you want to make sure that they understand that after you maybe played a couple times or, you know, maybe they eventually figure it out. They uh, want to start broad and then narrow it down. 
Um, now, the way that you can take this to the next level is you can almost incorporate similes and metaphors into the 20 questions. So one that I do when we are talking about uh, what most historians call the second wave of Im immigration at the turn of the 20th century is um, I say, what does a piece of chalk have to do with immigration? So usually they don't get it because it's incredibly difficult, but it doesn't matter. So they even go metaphorical and it's like, okay, so... You know, is it something about, you know, the chalk slowly dwindling down because it's hard to be an immigrant and come to a new country and it really wears you down? And they actually have some really great ideas. Um, but this one in particular is actually talking, this is actually a little more um, straightforward, is um, I just tell them that when immigrants are walking through Ellis Island, they would go through a quick, you know, like 20 second medical exam. Um, and if the person who is examining them thought that they had a medical defect, they would get, um, you know, a certain letter or symbol written on them. Uh, and they would actually have to go to a, a deeper exam. And then, you know, if you were cleared, you just went on to the next uh, station or part of the immigration process. So weirdly enough, you know, I know that they're not going to get this, but they never forget what's going on in Ellis Island and all the immigrants coming through and the process and everything. So even if they don't get the right answer, they're digging so deeply in their brain that it helps them remember. So even if they don't, uh, if you, even if they're not successful in the 20 questions and, you know, you win or whatever you want to call it as the teacher, um, that is totally fine because they're going to remember it, even if it's just out of anger of not getting it right. Now, if you really want to take this to the next level, um, I stole this from kind of a couple different things. Uh, but basically, I just had a student take a shoebox and make it look nice and put mystery box on the side. Um, and I put in whatever, um, it could be something that you make, it could be an object that has to do with what you're talking about. But I actually turned that into 20 questions. And if you really wanna get them going, you can actually put it in front of the class at the beginning. And everybody's like, wait, what's in that box? What's in the mystery box? Um, and it, ha it has them sort of going the whole time um, and you can kind of mention it every now and then and be like, do we want to see what, no, no, we'll just wait until later. So it really sort of gets them very interested because we always want to know, you know, what's in the mystery box. There's a lot of metaphors for that in our life. Um, so what you, uh, eventually do is, you know, in the middle of the period, or if you want to wait until the end, a, a true summarizer, um, you can get them to play 20 questions again. And it's kind of cooler because with the object, I found, weirdly enough, anytime you have an object, whether it's a prop or whatever, they really remember it a lot better. It's something physical, you can pass it around. So for example, um, when I was younger, uh, I was lucky enough to go to San Francisco and go to Alcatraz and they were um, doing this um, kind of fundraiser selling pieces of Alcatraz and they put it in a little box. So I put that in the mystery box. Um, and of course they never get it. Um, but they remember, you know, okay, 1920s, early 1930s, this is the rise of, uh, you know, the mafia in the United States. And, um, you know, they never forget that little piece of, it's really just a piece of concrete, uh, but they remember the time period and what's going on because of the mystery box and all of the, you know, it's a little bit different, um, but it also gets them to really dig deep in their mind. All right, what could this be? What is in this mystery box? Um, so nothing crazy, but just, you know, these small things that can get them to uh, think out of the box, if you will. Sorry for that. All right, let's summarize it real quick. So at the beginning, we talked about the one word summary. Make sure it's one word and equally as important, if not more, make them back it up. Why is that word reflective of what you've been talking about? Then we went over some similes and basically you're having them compare a historical idea that seemingly doesn't really connect to the time period at all, whether it be an object or whatever. Um, but then they sort of make some deep connections and sort of compare and contrast there. Uh, and lastly, 20 questions. I gave you a couple different ways to do that. Just you could have a straight up idea in your head. You could do um, what we talked about with Ellis Island and put more of a question slash simile slash metaphor or whatever you want to call it. Um, or you could get real crazy and um, incorporate the mystery box. So um, hopefully, as always, you can use any and all of these. And thank you for watching.